The strategy you use to grow to the point of sustainability will never get you to the point of exponential growth. Right? Your growth model and mindset have to change as your company changes. And Derek Dorner is going to walk us through how Roosted's growth model has changed and what that may mean for growth in your marketplace. Derek is the founder CEO at Roosted, and uh, he has got a history in catering, and uh, really there's a g- great story behind the creation of Roosted. And so, Derek, really grateful that you are willing to join us and share the expertise that, that I know you have because of conversations that, that we've had. And uh, maybe I'll just throw it to you and, and ask, could you give me a, just a brief overview of your history and what, what led to the creation of Roosted? Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, we had a Look, my experience was, um, I think, pretty typical in a lot of ways in the sense that, um, you know, the company was born really organically out of out of a need that I had in my life and my existing business at the time, which was a catering company. And, um, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention, right? And at that time, I had something like 500 employees and, you know, this was early, you know, 2010s. And there was really no tools out there to help automate the process and just, you know, communicate, automate the process of scheduling workers, communicate with them, get them on the schedule, figure out how many hours they work, all that kind of stuff that just has to happen with these gig type economy um, companies. And, you know, look, our challenge was the same challenge that everybody faced, which is it's a lot of work. It's just a lot of manual labor to communicate with all those people and get them scheduled. And I remember one, um, I remember one weekend in particular where we had uh, several events and uh, there was an event where nobody showed up, like none of the staff showed up to work. And I talked to this, to this, um, you know, this um, employee at the time um, and her name was Kate. And uh, she was, you know, she was in charge of getting all those people scheduled. I'm like, Kate, what happened? And she's like, I don't know. I just don't understand what went wrong. I think we were using, you know, Gmail and trying to figure out, you know, why they didn't get the emails and all that stuff and, you know, where all these people were. And long story short, um, nobody ever showed up because they just weren't communicated with. And so they weren't on the schedule that we thought existed. And, you know, look, that led to a thought process of there has to be a better way, which is I think how a lot of companies inevitably are born right um and you know you i started building this little by little and here we are today and uh so that's where you are today how how did you get from the creating roosted and to 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 where the company's at now um how did you start to get some traction and and how has the your your company your offering evolved over time yeah so i think that's probably the more interesting part um because I, I, look, that's the part that's that's certainly more unique with every company, right? Rather than just recognizing the need is, is how you actually execute on it. So, um, you know, with, with me specifically, with Roosted, we, uh, you know, I wrote a piece of software. It was pretty small and lightweight, but did the basic functions that I thought it would take. You know, rolled that out internally to my existing company. We were the pilot account for that. And then, and then, you know, we roll it out for free to the world. And it was just a complete, it wasn't even a freemium model. It was just purely for free. And I thought, well, we'll worry about how to monetize this later. Let's just get some users so we can start testing this and understand if this is something even that, you know, anybody else wants. Because I think it is, but let's validate that assumption, right? So we did that, got a bunch of free accounts, you know, and then eventually started charging for those accounts and really just built it little by little by, by you know, constantly listening to querying the customers, researching, figuring out what they're interested, figuring out what's important to them and just testing those assumptions. Right. I think that's the most important thing to um, to our journey is figuring out if what we're doing is really something that other other people find of value. I think when you're at that stage of a company and you're the entrepreneur, you know, you're the you're the you're the one that's starting and leading the charge. You have to be hands on in so many pieces um, beyond just leadership, organizational leadership. Um, And so there's so many growth opportunities there for you to say, like, okay, now I'm a part time developer. Now I'm trying to figure out our growth plan. And uh, (laughs) it's like it's it's hard to get your first dollar. Right. Um, And so I'm I'm sure there's a lot of opportunities for growth that you had and and areas that you uh, you got to experience as you built Roosted in that in the early stages. What would you think are some of the most significant of those? 
Look, that's a big question. There's a lot. Um, let me let me start by saying it this way, and um, you know we can probably explore that question some more. But one of the hardest things to learn for for anybody working at a startup, whether you're a founder or not, is how to prioritize because there's an unlimited amount of things to do. So regardless of the kind of business you're building, there's just there's the task list never ends, and you know learning how to prioritize and figure out what's really important to scaling this company at the end of the day, whether you're trying to scale from zero revenue to your first couple hundred dollars a month, or whether you're trying to scale from 100K a month to 500K a month, you have to learn what's important to you because you can go in so many different directions. With us, that has changed over time what those priorities are. And sometimes we get them wrong. The important thing is that you revisit those and reevaluate those so that they are aligned with your vision. I'll leave that there. I don't know if you want me to go deeper into some of no. that. Okay. No, that's great. It really points out just the the necessity of flexibility as you as your marketplace grows. Right. Um, right. You have to be willing to to change. And I think that when you see some more established companies experiencing problems. A lot of times it's a, it's a lack of flexibility. Um, it's things that have ha gone one way for a long time are unwilling to change. And, uh, and when that company starts to turn around is when you start yep. to let go of, you know, whatever, whatever you might call those. Um, well, not just that, but, but like also, you know, one of the, one of the critical things we're even, we're even exercising, you know, we're exercising this right now. This is this is something that we're going through internally, which is we are refocusing on listening to our customer base. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's easy to know in the very beginning that you have to do that because you're building something and you have to have them. Once you grow past a certain point, and that's not a point that's very far down the road, but once you grow past a certain point, you have a thing that you're selling, right? If it's a marketplace, it's grown to some you know, some type of a size. It could even be pre-critical mass. Um, but any business, you know, at a certain point, you're selling a product that you've kind of decided you're making, right? And you may not have to listen to your customers or feel like you have to as much as you did in the beginning. Um, and you have to constantly reevaluate that in order to understand that it aligns with the direction because your direction will invariably change. That you just, you almost, I can't think of a single, maybe Facebook. <laughs> There's so few businesses that are, that are good examples of they are exactly what they started out to be, right? The famous Airbnb example is they started out with cereal, <laughs> you know, yeah. or maybe that was just their marketing, um, you know, ploy, but still, right? There's so many different businesses that, you know, I don't even like to use the word pivot because it's overused, but that just realign. They, you know, they, they re-understand what it is that they're trying to do, what their mission is, what their customer base wants and all of those things. And you have to revisit that continuously. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's really important to listen to your customers. And I love that you've highlighted that now twice, because I think that that's a emphasis that gets overlooked a lot of times, especially in the early stages. You think like, we don't even feel like we've got it right yet. So um, we're not going to be looking for a ton of satisfaction uh, metrics for with our customers and yeah. make yeah. sure people love our product because we know we're still evolving, right? We're not looking for them to be completely 100% there yet because our product's going to be different in six months. But, and if, if you want to grow, like the number one indicator, this is my personal belief, by the way, feel free to disagree with me on this. But if you want to grow, the number one indicator that you're ready to start to scale is do, do our customers love our, our product? Right. Um, and, and so I love that you have, you I have, do, uh, I do agree with that. I completely agree with that. And it's not just customer satisfaction though, by the way, that's a more, it's a more nuanced question, right? Because, um, you know, uh, I may make something very simple and I might love it. Right. But it may not serve the purpose that it could truly be serving in, in, you know, in my life or in my business. Right. So it's, so you know, so those feedback mechanisms are not just satisfaction. It's important that you're taking all the right questions to your customers and you have to be very deliberate about what you're asking them and the information you're gathering. For example, you know, um, what else should we be building next? What's important to you? Does, you know, does our roadmap as we've envisioned it for the next six months make sense to you? 
Here's what we're thinking about doing. Is that something that you would see value in? Right? Those are the $64,000 questions that we have to get answered in order to run a business. And those never go away. They change in size and scope a little bit as you grow. But those questions from day one are present at day 10,000. Yeah. As a marketplace, you often think of the demand side being your customers, the supply side being suppliers. They're not really customers. Um, and just to bring bring this to them, I would think of your both your supply side and your demand side as customers. And m- many of you guys do. Uh, but it's important to be getting feedback from both, building out your product for both. And often, if you're a SaaS-enabled marketplace, you're building to serve your supply side and they become customers in some way. But man, I, I really love that emphasis. I know there's more to your story as well with Roosted. And um, I, I'd love to hear, were there any challenge that you, challenges that you guys had after Seed that you did not anticipate? Yeah, I mean, sh- yes, is the short answer to that question <laughs> is a resounding yes. You know, with us, I think any company that's, you know, that's probably, I'm just going to throw a number out there, less than 10 years old you're still very much identifying yourself and figuring out your direction, right? And that may be more nuanced or less nuanced. Um, Sometimes those pivots are bigger, sometimes they're smaller, but they're all very impactful, right? So like, you know, let's take marketplaces, for example. You're starting a marketplace, you know, there's always kickstart work that has to be done with any business, right? So um, any business, you have to start with, you know, you're, you're spinning up all of those very basic things, right? So you're spinning up, you know, your product itself, you're spinning up marketing, you're spinning up, you know, your support, um, sales, you're spinning up all of those things. On a marketplace side, within marketplaces, it's a little different, but you're still spinning up or you're still kickstarting buy or sell side, right? Because you have to test those assumptions and you have to figure out, Uh, you know, if this is going to be truly valuable to our customer base, do we have the right customer base? Are we asking them the right questions? Are we building them the right thing? Just like what we were talking about a minute ago. And, um, you know, once you start to test those, test those assumptions, you may learn that they're not correct, or that maybe as you, you know, let's say you're kickstarting the kind of buy side, you have a theory, you need to test that out. And then you learn that maybe those aren't as valuable on the sell side. Or, you know, maybe they're not selling for what you thought they would sell. That Maybe your model changes somewhat there around how you price those out, right? Um, and those are all things that, that you can encounter at any point. Yeah, with us, um, it's all, I think with us, look, at right, right around as we approached a million dollar annual revenue was, and I think this is really common too, we started to encounter some kind of what I would call critical mass challenges, and it's all exactly the same stuff that I've been talking about. It's just a revisit to those. I feel like so much of this is just relearning the core principles and reapplying those. You know, it's really easy to learn a skill and then you start and you're like, okay, I'm pretty good at this. I'm gonna, you know, and you continue along your merry way. But if you forget the foundations and you're focusing too much on, um, you know, the accoutrements of it, then you'll lose your way, right? And you and you have to maintain both of those things, right? So as we approach that that kind of what I, I call critical mass at that million dollar annual recurring revenue, um, you know, things changed for us. And with us specifically, you know, it's it's you know our marketing had to become more nuanced, our sales had to become more nuanced. With us, we focused a little bit more on bigger accounts and less on smaller accounts. So we had to understand what that was like. We certainly over, or I'm sorry, underestimated the the complexity of some of those things, right? And I think all that's pretty typical. I love that you, you kind of got into already a, a handful of ways that your growth model, your mindset changed around that, right? With, uh, you know, understanding you have to be more nuanced with sales and marketing and then going after bigger accounts. I think that's another huge piece there. So you mentioned for you guys, a million dollars was right around that critical mass period where you're like, we, we, we've got to start to change some things. And maybe one of the indicators that you guys had was we're starting to experience some of these issues. And so I, I think for, other businesses, marketplaces, maybe it'd be good to hear what are some signs that 
it might be time to start to evolve my growth model into something different. What are those pains they might be feeling or um, indicators that they might see in their business? Yeah. I mean, look, with us, there were some obvious ones and some less than obvious ones, right? The obvious ones are things that happen to every company. And the obvious ones are, okay, my, my revenue growth has started to slow, right? We're not getting the percentage gains that, that we used to see. Um, those percentage gains, especially pre pre critical mass, are a lot easier to hit. Right, big big jumps month over month, thirty percent growth month over month. At a certain point, that starts to slow, as it should, because your you know all of the rest of the tools that you're using, those foundational blocks, haven't necessarily scaled. Marketing, sales, you know, your maybe your core product itself, you know, all those different pieces, right? So that's one of the really obvious things that that you notice at some point is that your growth will will slow, mm -hmm. and and that's when you have to take it back to those basics that you know that we've been talking about, which is okay. Let's really understand what it is that we're trying to do here and make sure this aligns directionally with our vision. Let's make sure it aligns with who it is that we're selling to with what it is that our customer wants, right? And then there's some of it that's a lot more nuanced and less obvious. And that's where, I think that's where the devil is in the details. And this is probably where it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is how do I prioritize these things? What's really important? And what is it that, that I can let go of? Because you're always going to have that, that, to-do list of, you know, literally hundreds of things, right, that you should get done today. And, you know, if I'm only going to get 20 of these done, or if I'm only going to take seven more meetings today, or whatever it is, uh, you know, what is it that's going to move the needle for me? And how are we building this business so that it's something that's truly valuable to our customers? That's good. Really good stuff. And uh, once you start to see those see those signs, you start to realize maybe it's time to evolve. Um, what is the mindset that's maybe different when you, before you get to critical mass versus when you start to, to think through scaling and, and, and changing up your growth mindset? You know, I don't like this question and I'll tell you why, because I don't think the mindset is different. I think it's, I think I would argue actually that the mindset should stay the same. And I think that's the hard part because when you're small, you're focused on what is it that I'm building, right? Like, what am I doing today? What am I doing with my day, my week, and my month? What am I building? And are these people going to like it? And it's so easy to forget that. So I think the danger is more in letting your mindset wander mm -hmm. off of your original path too much, right? The original path being, let's make sure that we're building something that truly has value for the people that we intend it to. That's good. So maybe the mindset doesn't change. How do, how do you tactically change, you know, like you mentioned getting more nuanced with marketing and sales. What, what, what are the tactical differences that, that you may see um, help you after you start to hit critical mass? Yeah, that I think is a much better question. I like the way that that's phrased because that is where I'll use that phrase again, the devil is in the details, right? And so this is where you have to learn new strategies as you go, you know, so you're, you're, you, this is where you're building the plane as you fly it to figure out, okay, revenue growth has started to slow or this product, you know, this piece of my product is underperforming or my customer base, you know, I'm sensing that they're not loving this, um, whatever, whatever it is, um, you know, whatever challenge you have, you know, gosh, I think it's the same thing that we've been talking about, which is it's really just it's really just tearing that down and bringing it back to the foundation, right? So like, look, with us, you know, we have pivoted more and more. I think pivot's a strong word, but we have um, spent more and more time in the healthcare market over the last couple of years, especially since COVID-19. And it's really important on a very regular basis for us to stop readdress, think about that, think about where we want to go as a company. And then when we have that information, check in with our customer base and it's, and not just our existing customer base, but the customer base we're, we're also aiming to please, because that may not be necessarily the same group of people, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so we use tactics like if, if we're going to talk specifics, it's, you know, um, we survey them, we poll them, we interview them, we have conversations with them exactly like what we're having now about how they think about their business and where they want it to go. Um, you know, you have to be really, really close to the people you're trying to serve. If they're not your best friend, then you've probably deviated off of your original mission at some point. And so that's really what it's about. When we're talking tactically, we're talking about, we are talking about the leaders of the company being down and dirty, personally involved with what it is they're trying to do so that they can identify how it is they're serving their customer and the product they're building. That's great. And the, one of the reasons I really loved that answer, Derek, is that um, there, there, a lot of people will sell you like a one size fits all playbook for the growth model at X stage, yeah, you know, whatever it might be. This is your company size. This is your model. This is the model that you should be running, right? Um, and I think that what your what tactically what the nuances are within marketing and sales is going to depend on who you're the market that you're serving the product that you have it's going to be pretty nuanced depending on the company and i one of the things i think we've we've kind of um filled out on this podcast is we're not one size fits all playbooks don't really work generally but they especially don't work for marketplaces because they're so unique so nuanced most of the time and so i i really love the way that you uh you, you put that together, Derek. That's really helpful, I think. Yeah, I'll, and I'll add to that. Look, I'll, 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 you know, I'll give a piece of advice here, and I never give advice because I think it, it can be pretty, such a dangerous thing. <laughs> but you know, if there's anything that is one-size-fits-all, it's exactly what we've been talking about, which is, which is always listen to your customer, right? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't intend on you know, this being kind of a message of, my, of, of, of our conversation today, but it, it kind of sounds like it is in a way because that's something that, that can never go wrong, right? Um, we, we're, we are focusing more and more on, on, you know, I'll use us as an example again, we're focusing more and more on these um, enterprise healthcare sales. And, you know, I had to sit down and think to myself, okay, how are we training our team to do these enterprise sales, right? And there's a million ways you can, you can double check to make sure you're getting the right information. But, um, you know, like, look, you can go online, you can find a bunch of ways to do these types of sales. You could go ask chat GPT if you wanted to, but really it's how, how are we serving our customers and how are we listening to them? So it's the same thing that I've been saying, right? And, and I think that is the, the, one of the very few things that what would probably be in every single playbook. That's really good stuff though, Derek. I, I really love that. Um, and I think you kind of already answered this question just now, but I, I'd love to hear if you have just one big takeaway from this episode and uh, it may not be <laughs> the topic that we thought it would be, but um, what would that big takeaway be for marketplace leaders? Given the way that this conversation has gone, I think we should stick to theme, which is which is listen to your customers. Customer is king. Build what they want. And if you do that, you can't go wrong. It may not align with where you thought you were going, but if you serve them, then you're going to sell. That's good. So then outside of listening to your customers, maybe thinking through the, the growth model changes that we've been talking about, uh, is there something else that, that you say, I, this is a piece of advice I regularly give or maybe a piece of advice you received that was really helpful for you as you built Roosted? You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I think the reason this is a challenging question is because I don't know if I, if I got any particular, I got so much advice and I, it probably half of it goes in one ear, 99% of it goes in one ear and out the other. And especially when, you know, when we were starting, I can't tell you how many different how to's and growth guides and playbooks and consultants we hired and, you know, sales VPs we worked with and all kinds of stuff to try to get this scaled. Um, but you know, I think, Brooks, I hate to give you the same answer that I did on the last question, but I think it really is, which is you've got to just stay true to what it is you're trying to do. Don't forget those basics, the foundational blocks of why it is that you started building this company. And if you take it back to that, that you're trying to build something that's useful, that people will enjoy using, um, you know, that it's a, that it's a, it's, it's a service and product that customers will love. And if, you, and if that is part of your core mission, if that's your guiding light, then you're always going to be fine, right? But you have to check in with that continuously. 
And so that's my advice is to remain true to that. Very good stuff. Derek, um, wrap up here and just to thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're really happy to, to be partners with, with Roosted and, um, and really happy to, for, from me to you that you were able to join us on the podcast because I think that you shared a lot of good stuff here. And I think, uh, I think some of the, a lot of our listeners are going to be grateful for this. So thank you very much. And if you guys are listening, uh, I recommend going and following Derek on LinkedIn. We're going to have a link to his profile. Check out Roosted. They're doing really awesome stuff. And uh, so go, go check them out. We'll link to, to Roosted in the show notes as well. Uh, is there anything else that we could add in the show notes for you? Anything else you'd like to shout out, Derek? Yeah, um, you know, look, uh, just a, 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 a quick shameless self-plug, but at Roosted, we're building an HRIS specifically for the gig economy. And so what we do is we help companies like event companies and healthcare companies to manage all of these new gig workers, especially post-COVID. And we help them figure out when and where and who they can work for in a much more human-friendly way. So give us a look. Yeah, definitely go check them out. And guys, thank you so much for being part of the community. Thank you for contributing as well, not just you know listening to the podcast, but for interacting and uh, with our newsletter that has been sent out with, uh, with us on social and commenting, all that kind of stuff. We really appreciate. Thank you so much, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for having me, Brooks. Yes, sir.